All right, bus automation part three. Last time when we left off, we had gotten some of the lights working as well as home assistant working on the laptop as well as my phone um, just to switch the lights on and off. And we'd mentioned that um, we'd look into dimming to see if it was possible and what was required and things like that. And so we've done that and we've gone a little bit further. And so we wanted to share um, where we are with that with you guys. All right, so what we figured out is in order to dim the LEDs or any light, really the best way with um, with an Arduino type of setup like we have here with the ESP32 is to do what's called PWM switching, which is pulse width modulation, which is the same technology that old solar panels used to use to bring in power and reduce it down to charge a 12 volt battery. Anyway, um, what happens is, is there's a pulse and then the more it pulses, the brighter the light gets, the less it pulses, the dimmer it gets. So it, 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 it's actually pulsing, but to the human eye, it's doing it so fast. It's something like 12,000 hertz or something. It's very fast um, that we can't tell that it's pulsing. And so last time we had used um, a board like this, which has a bunch of relays on it. And these relays are good for 15 amps, um, but they're a mechanical switch. And so they're not fast enough to be able to do that. And so what you need is called a MOSFET. So there's a couple types, but these are the most popular ones. And these are the chips that are basically found in amplifiers. And so what you do is you connect, this works like a high speed switch. So you connect one end to the, to the source and then one end to the output. And then the other end is a signal. And what happens is, is that signal then tells it to turn on and off. And these can turn on and off very quickly. So this little tiny chip here, I think is rated for 30 amps. So um, they're also very, they can take a lot of amperage. And so one thing you wanna do with these small chips is you wanna completely isolate anything that's relatively high amperage with your the logic part of it, meaning turning things on and off and sending signals out. So you wanna do your best to isolate those two sides. So these boards here were, um, it's called opto-coupled. So these, these little chips on the bottom, what they do is they, there's basically a light emitter and then a receiver on the other end and that's what acts as the on and off switch. Um, what we did is we got these MOSFET boards and they also have that. So it's called an ISO opto isolated board. So anyway, I've been learning a ton of this stuff, but that's this chip here. And what it does is it keeps the logic side completely isolated from the high amperage, maybe high voltage side. So we run everything at 12 volts um, and then the logic side runs all at five volts. So that became another issue is how are we gonna drive the five volts? And what I found was these little guys here. So these will take 12 volts and then change it into whatever you want. In my case, they change it into five volts. And so what we have today is instead of the PC power supply, we switched that out for this little battery I made from some old laptop cells. And when it's fully charged, that'll put down, that'll put out about 12 volts. And so that goes through and it goes here and this powers the logic side. This is, this turns it into five volts. And then the 12 volts runs through this thing and then also runs the power to the lights. And so we did do a bunch of research and we did get the dimming to work. It's a little bit different of a setup for the home automation stuff. So home assistant has to be set up in a different way. And there's also, um, I think twice as many um, events that you have to listen for. And So I continue to be amazed at the relatively low price of this stuff. Um, these little converter boards that turn 12 volts to five volts, um, they're very efficient. I think 97% efficient. And these are about $2 each. They come in a little package like this, five of them, I think for $10. So they're tiny. Um, this MOSFET board, um, I believe this was $11.99 on Amazon, but then I bought five of them for about $25 off eBay. So if you can stand to wait a little while, you can get usually the stuff for much, much cheaper. So, and then these 
the main board that I'm using, which is an ESP32, which has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, capability built right into the board, as well as, I believe, 32 inputs and outputs, um, these are right at about $10. You can get them for as low as $6 if you go off eBay. So um, I'm still pretty amazed So um, at what the cost is. The relay board with the eight big relays on it, I think I paid eight eight dollars and 99 cents on amazon for that board i'll have the links to everything i bought and um home assistant and mqtt all the technology that i used in the blog post that accompanies this video um, much like i do with the other ones and so you'll be able to see the prices and things for yourself but everything on this table i think is probably less than fifty dollars So I could have gone with a custom board and a lot of people do with these types of projects is they will custom print a board and then you can get that done relatively inexpensively. Um, I think you can get a whole board printed for like six dollars. Um, and that's why I had when I originally started I just bought these little chips um, instead of a whole board because I thought maybe that would be a good way to do it. But then as I started getting further into it, what I decided was that um, it would probably be better to do all of this with off the shelf, relatively cheap hardware that's easy to obtain. And that way if something goes wrong, if we're out on the road or something, I can have a spare board or a spare processor or a spare button or something like that. So it seemed like doing a more modular approach with relatively inexpensive pieces was going to be a better solution for for our particular situation all right so a concept that i want to talk about that went into a lot of the decisions for some of the design of this is a concept called graceful degradation. It's a pretty big concept in software engineering and that's my background. And what it means is that for any given system that some or a part of the system will still remain functional even if large portions of that system have become inoperable or have been destroyed or things like that. And so what does that mean? It means if we don't have an internet connection, we can still turn on our lights. Um, if, say, the network switch goes down, we can still turn on lights and water pumps and things like so that. So a good example of graceful degradation is the way we wire our lights. And so um, what we're using is Home Assistant, which that's already a decision because most of the other home automation platforms have to go out to the cloud and then come back to operate things like switches and things like that. And so Home Assistant is very focused on being a local first type of system where if even if you don't have internet, everything works the way you think it should work. Everything communicates via the local network. Everything still functions with no internet connection. Then when you use the internet connection, you're actually internet porting into your system rather than your system goes out to the cloud, does some computation, then issues a set of commands back into your, um, into your uh, system or your environment. So Home Assistant itself is the first decision we made because we don't need internet at all to run it. It'll all run relatively local. The next thing is using these ESP32 chips. They have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in and we're using Wi-Fi to connect to the network um, so that we can speak to the MQTT server and Home Assistant. But we're not using that for our switches. So for our switches, we'll be wired directly into pins and they'll just generate signals. And so what that gets us away from is when I hit the switch to turn the lights on, um, it doesn't have to make an internet connect, or I'm sorry, a, even a local network connection. It just talks to the processor running directly, which then turns on the lights. And then after those lights have turned on, then it notifies Home Assistant or anybody else who cares that the lights are on. So that's a little bit different of a scenario than a switch that's that's only knows wireless and speaks MQTT. So now you have to have your MQTT server up, you have to have Home Assistant up and running, and you have to have a network up and running 
For this, the processor just needs to be running. So the processor will go ahead and turn those lights on and then it will tell Home Assistant, hey, the lights are on. If Home Assistant isn't up and isn't available, the lights are still on and off with the switch. And so that was our next challenge was how are we gonna do the switches? And so we have started to um, kind of put the switches where we want, where we think we would want them. Like as we come in the door, we would probably reach here to turn on the lights. And how many switches do we want? So we don't want like 30 switches on the door. Even, you know, there's, I mean, I think there's 30, I think there's 36 overhead lights all together. And so what I first started doing was I said, well, we could address each one individually and then we could kind of group them in software. But that ended up being a little tedious for not much gain. So what we've done is divided them into zones and usually they're left and right and then forward and left. So there'll be a, a driver's area front and left. Now the driver's area has two lights but those two lights are on the same circuit. In the living room area, we have eight lights planned and we have a left side and a right side, but the living room area is a little bit larger, so we also divide that in half. So there's eight lights, but four sections. And so the bathroom is very similar in that it's, or I'm sorry, the kitchen is very similar in that it's left and right only. So there's, I think there's six lights in the kitchen, but it's three and three. So we've tried to group the lights together in a way that made a lot of sense, um, both when using a switch and when controlling it via a piece of software or some automation piece. And so that leaves us in a relatively tricky situation with say a button, because one of the buttons we want to turn on the front lights, but we don't just want it to turn on the left light or the right light, we want it to turn them both on. And so now one button has to turn on two lights. And so fortunately in software, that's relatively easy to do, but then you run into problems like, what if those lights are at different brightness? Or what if one's on and one's off? What happens when you push the button? And so we had to solve some of those issues. Um, we also wanted to be able to control the brightness via those same buttons. So if you push the button just slowly, then it turns the light on and off. But if you press it down and keep it pressed, then it will slowly um, dim up, then dim down so that you can set your right dimness. So also, <laughs> in addition to that, we also wanted, if we have the, the dim setting set just the way we want it, but we just want to turn the lights off, when we turn them back on, we want it to remember those those dim settings. We don't want to go back through and have to adjust it every time. So I've built in smarts into the software that remember the last setting that you chose for those lights. And it's, it, it uses that as a starting point. And so we did wire in buttons. And so we've got one right here and it's a very simple button, um, but it demonstrates. So this would be sort of like the front over the driver's area and this would be the front over the passenger's area so when we push the button it would just turn both of those lights on and so as i explained earlier if i push and then hold it what you'll see is the light will become brighter and brighter and brighter and then it will become dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and you can see it dimming now um, and it will dim all the way down till it's as dim as it can go which i believe is right there and then it will start coming back up and then it will go to, so right there is as dim as it can go. So then it will start coming all the way back up as bright as it can go. And then when you stop it, then this is the setting it will remember. So if I turn it off, it just turns off. And when I turn it on, it comes back on to that exact setting. And so there was a little bit of that to program in to make things a lot nicer. So obviously now, since these are connected, we can also um, see them on our little interface here. So on our interface, we can turn them on and off via group, just like that. And you can see the lights come on and off, or we can dim them. So this one controls the brightness of the driver's lights. So there's all the way bright. And then if we slide it back, there it'll, di it'll dim it. So you can adjust the dimness of it. And same with the passenger light is we can turn it on and off and then adjust the brightness of it. And so when we turn it off, 
it will uh, it will remember that last dim setting. Also, if we happen to do it manually via the thing, then immediately the changes are reflected in the interface. And so you can see if I push this button, um, you can and you can even see it here changing on my phone at the same time. So you'll see it come on and come off. And even as I change the brightness, you'll see this little icon here will get brighter and brighter and brighter as the lights get brighter and then as it dims back down it will also dim back down and so we've built in quite a bit with that stuff um, we've also upgraded these little LED lights we had some white ones and now we're going with more of these um, they're just more like the aluminum color so um, that's where we're at with sort of the lighting situation so we've divided the bus up into zones and um, each of those zones will be controlled by a different pin and they'll all be dimmable independently and be able to be turned on and off independently so the nice thing about using these small processors and MQTT and Home Assistant and stuff is that we can um, we can use other switches. So the switches that we have that are wired directly into the processors that talk to the lights, we consider those to be sort of like a maybe like a first class citizen of switching the light on and off. Meaning network can be down, MQTT can be down all kinds of stuff can be down we can still control the lights but we may have other switches that are not these first class kind of switches we may put a switch right next to the sofa that just uses the mqtt and it you know it, it should work all the time but it's not the same first class kind of switch it will literally just generate a wireless signal or a, a, a wi-fi message that says hey turn on the light and so um then you know MQTT has to be up home assistant has to be up and then it'll turn on the light which should happen all the time anyway most of the time the switches should all feel the same it's just that when something goes bad um, then you'll notice a difference also if there's like a significant amount of network lag if you push the switch it may be a little while before the the light actually turns on and for, for when you're pressing a hard switch, sometimes that can be a little unnerving. With a hardware switch, you can guarantee that as soon as you press that switch, within a couple milliseconds, that light's going to turn on. And so that responsive time, you can only guarantee if you can control the environment with, uh, with which it's in. And you can really only do that if they're on the same processor. I can't control network latency or... Um, or if the database is running slow or anything like that but if it's on the same switching hardware then i can definitely control that so that's another thing is the response time of that's going to be much higher all right so what happens if everything goes down so in other words there's no network or there is a network but the processor goes down so what happens if one of these processors goes down so hopefully I'll have the code locally and I can just load it on another processor plug it in and we're good to go but if we still need to turn lights on and there's just no way we're gonna have switches that are more of a manual type switch um, so they won't be as granular as these where you can control the different zones it will literally divide the bus into three so it'll be front middle back and then maybe outside um, and so when you turn these lights on it'll just turn on all the lights at once and so the way we're going to do that is the way these mosfet boards work is if i provide five volts to the gate pin it's going to open no matter what <clears throat> And so what we do is we're going to run, you know, off of our little 5 volt little bus that is generated by our converter. We'll have 5 volts available and we'll run that to a switch. And then from that switch, we'll run um, into all the MOSFETs that need to be turned on manually. And so those manual overrides will override any PWM signal. It'll override anything and just turn lights on. 
So that's another way we're using sort of this concept of graceful degradation. If everything's broken, now if our MOSFET board is broken, then we're, we're kind of sunk and we're out of the water. But hopefully these are pretty reliable. Um, these get used millions of cycles. Um, they are pretty robust things and they're rated for 30 amps and we're running about maybe half an amp through them. So we're being extremely kind to them. So there's no need for heat sinks. There's no need to, to worry about overrunning these boards. And so we'll have some manual switches and they will literally be toggle switches that will manually override everything just in case everything is broken and we need lights on. All right, so the battery died on, on the camera so to add to the things that have gone wrong. So my computer's in the shop, the batteries are dying. We're having technology issues this week. Anyway, this is what we're gonna use. This is setting sort of the groundwork for what we're gonna use for our home automation stuff. So we've talked about it before, but we also want to put our, our solar panels deploy on um, some actuators and that's gonna be another integration that we, we're probably gonna end up using some kind of on off switches. They don't really need MOSFETs to turn those on and off, but um, we'll probably use some of these. We'll probably use some sensors for temperature. And so those are relatively inexpensive. So you can get these um, for around $2 each for relatively low um, within plus or minus, I think two degrees or three degrees. Um, they do temperature and humidity, and then if you pay a little bit more, um, they're a little bit more accurate on the humidity and a little bit more accurate on the temperature. So they make these, um, and so you can run all kinds of automations off of the inputs of the temperature. So we haven't started playing yet with, um, with the sensors and with the way all of that works, but those sensors can be used as input that we can then use in Node Red to try to start to trigger off some events to turn on fans or to um, open valves or things like that. And so we haven't gotten into that, but all of this is laying the foundation for what will be um, that sort of home automation stuff. All right, so thank you guys for joining us for an update on our bus automation stuff. Um, one of the reasons we had to solve this problem right now is because the way we talked about the way the switches work and they're wired right into the processors, we had to take all that into account as well as the lights wiring into the processor. Um, we had to take that all into account um, when putting in walls and things like that. And so this was a problem that we had to solve earlier rather than later. Um, with most of the home automation or bus automation type stuff, most of it will talk over the network and most of it won't need wires or anything like that. That's kind of the beauty of it. But for the graceful degradation part of it, we wanted um, not to be dependent on the network or the, um, or the infrastructure necessarily. So the lights and everything will still work even if we don't have those things um, enabled. Anyway, thank you guys. We hope to be doing weekly videos. We've had some issues with the computers and we've had a lot of projects on the bus, obviously. And so um, we've had, we have a couple of videos ready to go. They're just, my computer's currently at Apple being fixed for the second week in a row. So any, or the third week in a row. <laughs> anyway, um, we hope to be doing weekly videos next week. And um, thank you guys for joining us. We hope to see you next week. Yeah. Hi. Ah.